I'm voguing. This is my voguing. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm with Mark. How hey, are you? Hey, hey, hey. It's another day of me. <laughs> uh, hey. How are you? Good. We, I had fun last night. We went to your house. Yeah. Your studio. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Had some salmon. Yeah, you cooked. Mark the, cooked. Who knew? The problem was it was going to be really good, but then we got totally lost in time, and then we had to actually... I thought it was really good. I, I would delicious. have been better if I had like an extra hour of preparing instead of rushing it. I thought it was delicious. Well, thank Sweet you. potato fries. I live on those now. Air fryers. You know, if there's an air fryer company that wants to send me a free air fryer, I can send one to my parents because I think they, they came down from Seattle and they're like, oh, we, we have, we'll, we'll, we'll try that. And then I made air fry uh, sweet potato fries and it was just like, the it's air delicious. fryer of 2022, I think that's the invention of 2022 or the new, the, the best thing in the kitchen of 2022 is an air fryer. Well, Brussels sprouts for the uh, UK people. We all love our Brussels sprouts. It was delicious. So yeah, so stay tuned because next week, um, Eric, Next week, we're going to put out uh, um, the, tour? the tour, aren't we, Eric? We are. We are. Yeah. yeah. That's a subtle hint of like, please, Eric, can we edit that for next week? See, the way we, we this is how we communicate here. <laughs> so this could be a lot of fun. So I love your room. I thought it was, uh, it was really ergonomically well designed. <laughs> like yeah, that? it really worked out. I mean, considering it is much smaller than the other one, but I'm starting to really focus on making sure that the atmosphere is more important than the, the old traditional control room. So yours is like a mixture of the two. Yeah. Obviously, because you have an SSL, it's a large console, it needs to have the room to do that. But the thing that I really switched over in the last couple of years was I'd rather have stuff at my hand disposal than having to get up and walk over and grab something if I needed it. And being forced to being in a small room, it became, oh yeah, I did that on purpose. Yeah. You know, like the whole concept of being able to have it enclosed. But it was crazy. The fact that all the panels and everything from the other room, which was easily twice the size of it, maybe even three times the size of it, was able to enclose into the small room just perfectly. So, but that couch, uh, this couch that's literally the smallest thing, which I'm going to get. Yeah, I'm going to find that and send that link to you. We're going to get it for uh, for the for the studio in the house, which we are going to finish up now that we have new computers. It's a whole long story, which we'll save for another day. Yeah, we should definitely do an episode on the studio, Mac Studio, because I'd like to know how powerful and how. We, How hard we, you can we just push got it. two. Yeah, that's why Connor was just saying that. Yeah, so we're going to do the whole HD native. Well, it's the hybrid system. It's the hybrid system, so it's going to be using less cards. So we're going to run that completely with the SSL, and then in the in the studio in the house, we're going to run the ultra and have it completely native. So yeah. So it slowed down. We sort of built the studio and then we spent like three months trying to figure out what computer to get. And we were going to get that. What's, what's the one you call, got? The Mac Pro. And then we So just... I got that right when the pandemic, my, my old Mac Pro 12 core took a dive. And I'm like, oh no, I got to get one of these new ones. Oh. And I'm native. I haven't been on uh, HD, HD with hardware since um, TDM. HDX a little bit, but I just didn't feel like I needed it anymore for mixing. So Native's been completely stable, and the new Mac Pro that's 16 core is absolutely insane. It allows you, I mean, you can literally shoot 4K video and have a 96K session rolling, and it's fine, but it's so big, you know? This obvious, it would be really nice to be able to get it smaller and just have things smaller. Since it's native, I don't need all the chassis or the cards or anything either. Mm -hmm. I guess I do because the UAD, I'll take that back. I have three PCI. Yeah. But they're going native as well. Right, we'll see how that goes, if that pans out well. I think it's an inevitability. It's, um, I mean, obviously when, the thing that gave Pro Tools the leg up back in the day when we started um, was the computers 
weren't as fast. Right. And you had this card-based system that was superior to the computers that were going in. Um, Did somebody ever do a, I mean, maybe they can answer, is there null tests of native versions of the Plugin Alliance UADs, plugins versus the Shark version of the UAD plugins? Does that make sense? I'm wondering if that's going to be the same. Is it the same Sonics? Does it null I those mean, plugins off platform native versus I the card version? I had this exactly the same question of Colin, you know, Colin McDowell, who I think everybody's favorite plugin designer, just a wonderful guy. And um, I think, as far as he's concerned, I can't remember if he had any differences. As far as he's concerned, it's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, you'd think it would be. Yeah. But then again, who knows? I mean, it'd be interesting to know. It's kind of the similar thing of saying, remember the power core stuff, TC power core? Yeah. yeah. That was a hardware yeah. runoff, very similar to the UAD thing back in early 2000s. And that sounded very different. Karen says, yes, they're the same. They know. Okay. Yeah. Great. Like, I don't know anything. Jason Salzman at UAD was one of my best buddies. He's just such a great guy. And anytime I have issues, I just push him. And he's he's pretty happy with this the, the native universe, like how it's responding and stuff. So I'm excited to see how they, if they go full in and port everything right away within the next year. I think computers are so powerful now. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that it's not really an issue, but there was yeah, there was a time for a long. It was a long time. You couldn't really run a big session natively on a computer. But yeah, on a, alone. I mean, we should do something where I was telling you last night about the the template with all my stems. I mean, literally, I've got for every bus, which I have sixteen buses. There is a additional three or four reverbs to every bus. So you multiply that, and then for the Bracasti I have, that's cloned to 16 Seventh Heavens. Mm. And then to that, it's cloned to back down to the, the stems, 16 stereo, with whatever's on my master bus mm -hmm. to each thing. So each thing, and then that prints to another. So, I mean, it's another 150 auxes or something like that, that is always there in the background going. I can't just inactivate it because I'm always scared if I turn it on after the song's mixed, it's not gonna be there, so I don't know. But I can tell you that it seems to be stable enough that it doesn't, I haven't had a crash or anything, ever. Yeah. I haven't had the spindle. Um, there's some graphics issues in Avid, but I think that's a Big Sur thing. Everyone seems to have a war against Big Sur. So I'm excited to see, what's the new OS? Monitor, what's the new OS? I'm Monterey. Mon whatever it is, yeah, that sounds right. I think so. I think they got things back on track for when Catalina, because I think Catalina was probably the strongest. Mm -hmm. Big Sur was kind of like this shit storm. And then, yeah, Monterey is probably much better. Yeah, we can't load the latest on this computer. So that has right. stopped us. We've got, we're running, you know, Pro Tools ultimate but we haven't got the latest version of ultimate so when i was in seattle i remember new system. that computer i remember my my dad was putting railings on the, there's a guest house this is during covid so i had this tiny little house i was staying in and my dad was putting railings on it and then all of a sudden the computer just died in the middle of me mixing um that moxie movie mm -hmm. that netflix film and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? It's in the middle of the pandemic. We couldn't upgrade it. I was just like freaking out. I remember going out there and my mom just got back from a walk and I'm like, I think I gotta buy a new computer. <laughs> but they're like $7,000. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. But once I got it, you know that moment, it was like Christmas. It came and I unboxed it. But then it was the two full days of installing all the plugins and contacting each place to make sure that everything is good. And yeah, I think a lot of it was just that hell of trying to get all of the things start working again. But the day you launched it, and I remember 
before on that computer, on the Mac Pro 2012, which is probably what you have. Mm -hmm. Um, no, this is 2009. Oh, 2009. 2009 cheese, cre cheese grater. I couldn't even run one Acoustica plugin on that. Oh. So when I got the new one, just for fun, I opened up a 96K session. I put 36 Acoustica plugins, hit record, and I don't even think it hit 20%, which was such a, I mean, it was like 200 times better. So that was the first, yeah, this is great. Looks like we've got a little technical issue here. Mike is working and then it doesn't. This doesn't work, I'm gonna swap it out. Want to do one of these things? <laughs> Hi there, my name's Warren. <laughs> I'm Mark. Is it working, Eric? Mark Nelson. Live. Do it live. Lemon esque said sounds fine here. Warren's is okay. Are we are we checking? You guys are just talking. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, Art Gilmore says I can hear them okay. Receiver battery. No, no, we, the batteries and everything's good. So it sounds like something else. We've got the technical guys from afar checking. Technical guys meaning Eric. Standing by the executive producer, executive producer, e Mr. Eric Von. Eric Von. So, I was telling you guys a little piece of music you guys should go check out on YouTube. Type in Real Love John Lennon Imagine Motion Picture version, and it'll come up with the, the 1985 movie art from that. And it's just him from 1979 playing acoustic guitar and I just cannot stop listening to it. It was obviously remastered or something because it got all the tape hiss and stuff out, but oh, it's so good. Just that, just that is I've been listening probably two, three dozen times in the last few days, just over and over and over. And we were watching Let It Be last night or Get Back and then we opened up Let It Be, just the original Let It Be and man, was that an ugly looking movie back then. And how good of a job. Oh, he did an amazing job. Isn't he? Absolutely. I can't amazing. even, like, just seeing the old version for what they released in 1970 versus the, the super high def upgrade. You're just like, how did they do that? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Are we working now, Eric? Getting a new transmitter. Is new, it working? Are you um, You test before you hand it. So it works, yeah? Um, oh, okay. Always have one ready to go, technical guys. Is it working now, Eric? Can you hear me now, Eric? Can you hear me now? I'm on a delay. Yes, it is. Yay! Okay. There you go. I've got two. I got two sets of microphones on me. <laughs> Apparently, one of them does now work. Um. Yeah. No. I. We could talk about that movie forever. That was amazing. Um. Tell us a little. Real quickly about that, I did Please. hear that they were supposed to release the Blu-ray last week, and the rumor is the reason why they didn't and they stopped production on it, they pulled it out, pulled it back, was because they were going to possibly release a new version with like triple the amount of footage. Because I think Peter Jackson came out saying, well, how much do you want? So and we they want also mentioned that we they're going to put we want. the whole live rooftop is now going to be without the whole commentary on the street and stuff and just the band, which is really cool. So could be really cool. Yeah, I, that that was. I wouldn't say I was disappointed because there's nothing about that movie I was disappointed in, but I love that movie. Everything I grew up about it. You, you're right. First of all, it looks beautiful. It sounds beautiful, and you just you forget it's you know. Nearly fifty years ago, I think we were I'm sitting sorry, it's last, over fifty years ago. We were sitting there, yeah. We were sitting there last night. It was after they played on the roof, and they were all sitting in the control room listening to playback. And I remember just being like, "I never would have thought they would have that footage of them responding, listening to the rooftop." Mm -hmm. And I, I think I said last night was it just felt like I'm dreaming. Like if I dreamt what it was like to be in the room with them after that, that's what it would look like. 
because it was just like hovering around in everyone's face and Yoko was giving, breaking the gum in half. And I said, my mom used to do that, yeah. breaking the gum in half and giving them and they're all, and John's just goofy and like they're all on that adrenaline of playing live for the first time in four years or something like that. It's just so crazy. Yeah. Anyways, we can go on and on about that again. <laughs> the um, So, quick question. Um, let's talk a little bit about the course that you just did, because tell me about the artist. I don't know a huge amount. Brandon? Yeah. Brandon Bartier is a great guy from Texas, indie artist. Um, reached out to me a couple years ago. He's got this really, really great focus on making sure that everything is done you know, truly. So he'll, he'll take the time to record things with proper equipment, with proper musicians, analog, 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 that sort of stuff. And he'll do revisions and he'll do things where he's just like, that's not good enough, which is really important in my opinion, where people, it's not like a perfectionist kind of approach. It's more of, I want to make sure I can capture the vibe right. And that's something that, I don't know, we were talking about that in the studio situation where it used to be, in my opinion, if you didn't have a room that looked like a control room, like a corporate looking control room, it wasn't <laughs> professional. And now it's, I don't want that room. Sure. So it's similar to making music where it's like you can use the right gear, but if you didn't get the vibe right, it doesn't matter. So I think for him, he was just able to really be in a position to grab the right talent, the right players, the right gear. And his songs were always strong, but I think the way he was able to kind of shuffle through those just instantly made it exactly what he was going for. And yeah, just being able to mix the stuff was an absolute delight. So I was thinking, what song can I do for this course that has kind of a lot of different elements, not just um, kind of dirty rock, but had kind of high fidelity aspects of it, had dirtiness aspects of it, had acoustic guitars, had hard guitars, had, you know, all these elements, including like a really super established drummer that played on it. And that really was pretty much it. It kind of answered itself after I finished that going, that's the song I want to do. So yeah, it's a great track. And just hearing it kind of put together worked out good. Definitely. Um, getting asked here, Vijay says, um, does it have your template in it, the course? No, but I don't know if you'd want my template. I mean, you would, but I think I, I have so many plugins that probably people might not have that it would uh, get a they don't have a Bukasti. But that's okay, because in my template, the Percassi is just one channel. The seventh mm -hmm. heaven is all the stems, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. So most people could open it up and it would kind of look right, but a lot of it would probably be blacked out and it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense. Right. I mean, I, I can get it. Email me. I don't care. I'll send it to you. Yeah. Well, let's do that as a separate thing. We'll, we'll, we'll create a template. Sunset Sound. Sunset Sound. Yeah, baby. Um, Vijay says more interest in the structure than the plugins. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll figure something out. We'll we'll maybe we'll do like a fifteen minute breakdown and then showing how it works and then do a. It's very into. complicated, and if your system can't handle it, it's it doesn't work. So I think a lot of it. Maybe I can do like a smaller version of it. In general. But it's just, it's more about streamlining and making sure that everything is in good place. I'm still stuck on one option. There's a latency thing that happens to the stems versus the analog print that I've tried, me and my assistant Ryan have tried a bazillion times to try to figure out ways to kind of sync it latency-wise. Pro Tools is so weird with the delay compensation that it doesn't necessarily work accurately every time. So I was just talking to my friend Scott last night about this, of like, it always is within comb filtering. It's never sample accurate. So the stems versus the, um, I would say the stems versus the master analog print is always gonna be a tiny bit off. So when you're doing 
you know, trailer music or any orchestra film stuff, you need to make sure that the master full is within 100% sample accurate of the stems. So when the editor, whoever has them, they can jump between the master and an instrumental or whatever. And if it's out a tiny bit, that's a problem. So most of the time I have to hand align it. Now I've tried to use delay plugins. I've tried to use delay comp inside Pro Tools. It's, I don't know if it's because it's running off of the busing power of what's on the master because the, nothing changes in the stem land. This is something that I might need some hands with some other guys. Maybe come up with some idea, another live video where we'd get. Yeah, real I think geeky. that'd be really good. Yeah, I like that a lot. Oh, oh, is there coffee coming in? Coffee from my country grab, if you could pass that down. Oh, did you want this? No, no, I don't. I, I'm, I'm off coffee. Yeah. Hey, look at this. It's a John Lennon. John cup. Lennon quote. That's my cup from home. I brought it in a couple of days ago. There is a great woman behind and every, every idiot. idiot. <laughs> John Lennon, my favorite guy. Um, there's a lot of questions here. Great. So I'm I'm going to see if I can encourage you to try and try and be as quick fire as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry to create. Um, well, there's a nice statement here. Stephen says his friend is at Abbey Road at the moment with Dave Gregory. That must be pretty freaking awesome. That's sweet. What yeah. room? Studio two? Yeah, what room and what are they doing? What's Dave playing on? Tell us more. Stephen, tell us more. Can't just kind of whet her appetite with some uh, some conversation like that. And Greg, Dave's back in England now, isn't he? He was living in Australia. I heard he was like a, had like a sheep farm or, so, or was it New Zealand? I don't remember. But I did hear he went back and he started playing again or maybe he didn't stop playing when he was in Australia. Don't know. Obviously, huge fan. Um, Amazing. Oh, I'm getting coffee. Ooh, there you go. It's starting to kick there you in. Go. Um, well, Vids for Squids uh, says, what new computers did you get, Mark? But I, I assume... 16 core you... Mac Pro. Mm. 2020, I think, which is funny because it's like looking back, you're like, that's two years old already. That's I know. insane. And they brought out new computers already. It's crazy. That studio one, I'm going to figure that sucker out. Yeah, well, we got that. We've got, but we got two of them. So we're gonna do videos on those soon, guys and uh, guys and girls. And uh, yeah, maybe come, maybe come by when we've put, in, we've done the native one, and just come by and play with it. Yeah, put it to the test. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to give you this to take. Yeah, converters. Lots of lots of converters. So we've got the Stam are sending us the uh, their Fairchild. Um, so we want to do a shootout with that, but not. Not opinion, I just shoot out. Just to prove. No, I want to hear it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's the healthy side of competitors. And I mean, the AT101 is not a Fairchild. It's, yeah. it's analog tubes design, which is Simon in England, who's an mm -hmm. amazing dude. Sure. And they're just passionate. It's like all these guys are creating their own flavors from these legendary pieces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously the Stam is a little less expensive, but it could still sound yeah. absolutely phenomenal because the AT101 has stuff that the stand doesn't have, but I think the stand has some stuff, features like the mix knob and stuff that the yeah. AT101 doesn't have. So it's like the unfair child too. We should get one of those in. Yeah, we should get one of those. And we should just, we'll print through all of them and you can hear. Uh, and You can hear and you can decide yourself. Remember, whatever we do when it comes to reviews and stuff, we always give away multi-tracks and stuff so you can hear on your own unbiased because I might like something that he doesn't like and he might have something I don't like. So it's kind of, you know what I mean? It's everybody, subjectivity is what makes music so beautiful. Um, so just because we might have an opinion doesn't mean we're right. It's just our opinion. Um, I'm always right. Alexi, who's one of our great subscribers, been with us forever. Um, says he loves your videos. Thank you. Uh, Mist A, Ed, says, if you're recording drop D on a guitar, should you also drop D on a bass? No. And if you do, I would double uh, overdub the bass. Really? Yeah, because I feel like when you start dropping, I know it's a sound in metal to, yeah. to really tune down. I feel like when you start changing the bass, setup it doesn't handle low end the same way i like either you just get another bass so i don't remember what note is a five string what a b 
The lowest note is a B. Uh, it depends on how you chew it. Some people get an A, and I've seen even more insanity. But um, I suppose technically, it depends if you're going to record on the fifth fret. I've got to look at this. Just happen to have a Misha seven string guitar here. So if this is uh, that's a drop C. This is drop C. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, a lot of strings. Seven. Um, so we got A. He, oh, so he's got that down to a, a D. D. Yeah. He's gone down to a D, but I suppose technically if this was um, an E... What does it go, what's the lowest? Well, if it was, if it was an, if it was an E... So this is D, this is what? Whoa. Uh, so that's down to an A. Wow. So basically it means he can do... So I would say, you know, the reason why I wouldn't drop D a bass for that is because I'd like to have the definition of the bass to be solid. So if you wanted something different, you would overdub that. But you, you'd extend it with that. If it was in full, you're right, it'd be a B. It'd but be if, a little higher, but it would actually have a little more solid right. tone to it versus yeah. if you dropped it and you loosen it up. It's kind of like, you know, the, the um, what was the band? The Wrecking Crew, when they would have three basses and two of them would be electric. One yeah. of them would be pick, almost yeah. baritone-like pick stuff. The other one would be whole notes and then the, the upright. I think by allocating the proper focus for each thing, you know, you hear that in the White Album too, mm -hmm. where you can hear the pick bass, but then there's a low foundation too. There's almost two basses going on. Yeah. Um, just an opinion. Well, like you did in the video last week, I've, I've done videos with similar sort of ideas where I'm mixing, where I'll take, um, I'll take like in a chorus and I want super massive low end, you'll do yeah. like a subby bass. And then I'll take the main bass and just wipe everything out below like 250. Yeah. I don't know what you, can't remember what frequency you chose, but like below say 250, not, not aggressively like a high pass like that, but a nice kind of gentle slope. And then just let that keyboard bass just be massive and consistent. Um, I think it's very typical of like killers as well. They do a lot of that because that bass player plays with a pick and distortion. Yeah, I, this, th that song, the, the Brendan song, has that kind of thing where there's mm -hmm. a lot of picking kind of killers -y. and you of course in the beginning you lose all since he's high picking you lose all that because the drums are really rocking and the guitars are big there's no bottom end there's no bottom octave so it was one way to either put it through like an r bass or a subharmonic plug-in but that doesn't really do what this needed to do you needed it to be just like air you didn't want it to sustain or change notes the way that the, the bass was doing. So sometimes creating an ele another element that's just focusing on like the 60 hertz, which might not be translating on a small speaker or something, but when you do hear it in a normal driver, it sounds huge. Yeah. There's a lot of questions, variations of questions on gain staging. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to sort of like add them all together to one question. Because do you... I don't personally have a, oh, everything's mixed up, minus 18, blah, 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 answer to anything. I just don't. And I don't gain stage things to an exactly the same level at each time. I, I, I just, is it true to say that once you've been doing this a long time, you just intuitively do things? You don't have like a set thing? People are always after like an answer from me. Yeah. Like, oh, I do everything at minus 18 because blah, 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 blah. I certainly don't know the, the super answer. Yeah. I can only explain from absolutely failing multiple times trying to figure it out. I could tell you that for those that have only been in Pro Tools the last five years or DAWs for the last five years, it was a nightmare getting digital to sound great 20 years ago. Oh yeah. Because for some reason the busing in Pro Tools was so lacking that you had, everyone thought you had digital so you could just take your analog approach and get as much content into this little bit of bandwidth, but what it was doing was making everything sound. I think Tad Donnelly, remember Tad Donnelly? Mm -hmm. Tad Donnelly said, it sounds like you're hitting the wall. I think the biggest issue was most people that would take a process of digital, wait, you were interviewing who yesterday, or two days ago? John, John Kurlander. He went digital back in the 80s, didn't he? Yeah, he went He went digital. Well, he at Abbey Road, um, they were, they had... He, brought, he brings that up where he, he says... He brought the first digital system in, yeah. Yeah, he brings that up on an article, I remember. It's funny, I was just going to take what he said, but I'll give him the credit because he's the one that said it. He yeah. said, 
back when they got their first digital desk, they mm -hmm. all hated it until one of the tech came in saying, you're not thinking yeah. correctly. You're taking analog approach to yeah. a digital content. Tommy Vicari said the same thing, yeah. I do believe that once you start understanding digital, and now that Pro Tools is like has a 32-bit or 64-bit, whatever it is, it allows you to really push things and it's not collapsing. I gain stage a little differently when I'm summing so just because I'm going out into analog gear and I want to make sure I'm hitting it properly because I don't touch it and I don't want to hit too much. But like if you're coming into here, you're going to have way more headroom than you would at the digital bus mm -hmm. because this is just way more forgiving. So, I mean, I like to come back in and make and sure. And when it goes wrong, you like how it goes wrong. Yeah. You like the sound it's, of it it's going It's very wrong. forgiving. Yeah. And in the digital land, it, it's not at all. So you have to be kind of cautious and just never lean on your two bus. Like if I took all my plugins off. the opposite of the SSL. If yeah. my two bus is like this, yeah. that's when it sounds the best. It folds out. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, I, I, mean, I can't say never. I should never say you should never. Never say never. I can only say I would never. I'll just start doing that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in general, gain staging is really complex if you make it be. Don't even overthink it. If it sounds okay, but you can really tell when you're starting to pinch everything down mm -hmm. and then you just take a second, print that, and then have that print and then bring everything down with clip gain. Not with your faders, but with clip gain. And make sure that you can print that and then listen to the two and how it responds. And I'm not talking about compression or stuff. I'm just talking about how it interacts going through a digital bus. It does yeah. sound different. I think a lot of the questions that people have are probably based on plug-in manufacturers because plug-in manufacturers will, especially if they're doing analog emulations, uh, have an optimum kind of level that sounds like the analog gear. So if yeah. you put it too soft, you don't get the saturation, the harmonics, the distortion, etc., that you want from it. And if you print it too hot, it folds in on itself and sounds like crap. So I do understand some people's trepidation. I think the reality is, is like when it, we were all fully analog, we had that big tape machine thing over there. We had tubes, we had that transformers, and everything was rounding off tracks. That's a big Studer. Yep. Yeah, it's an A80 Mark II. It's weird. I didn't never noticed how skinny it is. Yeah, they had, they have, it's very thin. They, they had two styles. They had one that went, that was wide over the top and one that went up. That Deep. one goes up. The, um, Put that but, on reverb. Yeah. <laughs> bought that for $2,500. I think they're like 12 grand now. Wow. Yeah. Bought it when nobody cared. Now people care enough. But anyway, um, the, um, so the, the, what I'm trying to say is like, there's a bunch of mumbo jumbo about stuff. Oh, kids now compress more. I don't know what they're talking about. I've worked with Jack and Shelly and all those guys. And, and I, I, they always made me use a far more compression than I ever would use on my own. I think they compressed a lot more back in the 50s and 60s than we think they did. In 70s I think it was, well. absolutely, but I think it was more forgiving because analog handled it well. And the other issue is we always forget is you take a new record that's cut really hot. Let's say Eric Boulanger masters a record for you. He's gonna make it incredibly loud, but very, very beautiful sounding still. You put that record on certain record players from the era, their line amps aren't designed to handle that kind of output. So you have to remember traditionally what was happening at that time where a lot of the consumer level record players and stuff I'm talking about weren't just designed to handle that output. But at the same time, they were still going after loudness wars just as much as we are now. I mean, that's why you listen to a Beatles record and it's compressing so much that you can't even hear the compressor, in my opinion. Like vocals and like listen to Motown. There's so much compression on the vocals that it's past the point where it's pumping. It's just on. And a lot of that is, I think, just to get the loudness signals up for radio, for records, because at the time they were still going after loudness. It was just different. Yeah. Um, what summing are you using? You're, 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 everything's going through your Sigma, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. I think they just discontinued, which is sad. Really? Yeah. I was thinking about getting one. <laughs> Get, in Get in there. Uh, I think a lot of it is just, I think that box, it's weird. 
I went through a lot of different summing mixers. I bought, my first summing mixer was a custom API. That was really special, um, but I was just too worried to have that much analog components that was handmade mm -hmm. go bad. Because the problem with that is those elements where when something starts going, you just don't hear it. It goes slow and then things start changing. So channel 12 started having weird roll off issue because the op amp was going weird or something, mm. the transformer. And that freaked me out. So I wanted a summing box that was a little more modern. It, but the problem was they all sounded similar. They all sounded like passive summing into a preamplifier. And that's awesome and it sounds good, but you were missing this depth thing that a lot of these things did. I owned the Thermonic Culture Fat Bustard, which was spectacular sounding, but super vibey for one type of sound. So it wouldn't work with rock, it wouldn't work with certain other, certainly wouldn't work with like trailer or modern pop because it's just so dark and fat that it wasn't kind of crossing over. So finding something that had the whole roundabout was tricky. And the Sigma had that, but it also had all these other features with like analog um, control with MIDI, digital control with analog fades and stuff like that. And I didn't care about that. I mean, you could literally control anything in that box. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about vocals here. Because, um, you know, a lot of people are producing their own stuff these days, as we know. Um, some sort of generic questions about favorite EQ points. I think for me, I don't know if I have that answer, um, you know, because everybody's voice is so dramatically different. Um, but, I mean, I'm always looking to add air. I know. Do you... I don't even know if I can hear air anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't... what I mean is like making it bright without without bringing up horrific frequencies. So I, know I like the that trick that... of de-essing and boosting, de-essing and boosting. Yeah, the... the... Thing that's been really bothering me lately is people seem to be even super pros with insanely high-end gear mics and stuff they, they they record in the wrong environment they think that more dead it is the better but what that does is it puts you into this weird place like this would be a perfect room for vocals right it's not super 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 dead but it's not live there's no you can hear in your s's and stuff i've been getting vocals that sound like they're in a corner so there's all these weird resonant buildups. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put a ton of like soothe or something on it to just naturally get all these weird mm -hmm. phasey resonance out. Same with glass or anything like that that causes an issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. I was just listening to Bob Dylan working out yesterday and you could tell it was a dynamic mic, but it was just so smooth mm -hmm. and you could get away with things because it was just a great sounding vocal. I feel that obviously the SM7 has been played out, but yep. I do believe that like any mic is good enough if you just listen, make sure that there's things in the room that aren't fighting it. So if you're in a in a box or I'm a little anti these 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 cone shaped things that you put a mic in because sometimes I feel like whatever they're using, it makes it sound like it's feeding back and resonating. Yeah, I'm not, I, I have nothing good to say about those things whatsoever. I would rather you just go mm -hmm. into your, open your closet door. Yeah. If you're in your bedroom, open your closet door and put your microphone where you're standing in front of the closet. With we're we're getting, for the, for the studio in the house, we're gonna get a vocal booth. There's a company uh, we're talking to at the moment that builds like a actual like proper yeah. little vocal booth. Yeah, the cones and the balls and the this and the that. And, and frankly, the microphone's pointing this way. So most of the sound you're going to get is, guess what, from behind you. Yeah. And all these things always seem to be designed around like reflections coming that way into the back of the microphone. And I've built a hundred vocal booths. I'm sure you have in studios. Yeah. And every single time we build it, we build a shape like this. And the guy or the girl stands there with the mic facing that way. And we get a lot better sound than if we decided to do it the other way around. It's, I, do, I have used those shields, though, on ribbon mics when I'm trying to kill the back end. Yeah. So I can have a, a, a ribbon mic face the drums. And I don't want the ambience from behind. I'll stick that. These microphones are designed to be open. They're just designed for that. The diaphragms are designed to not have 
like things not pick up from the back. But that being said, it's designed to pick up from the front. I always <laughs> put an isolation on my snare mic. Yeah, it's either I take a pop filter, and then I put like a something hard, like a magazine in it or mm -hmm. a little book, and then I put a skull cap or uh, like a snow cap on it, so I can separate from the hi hat in the snare, just because I like to crank the top end of a snare. But the other one was putting like your 57 through like a styrofoam cup. That works well because you're talking about high frequency. It, it cuts way quicker versus low end to get stuff out of it. But other than that, maybe brass or something where you're putting like a ribbon into a shield. But you got to be very careful because they're not designed, which is another thing like an M50 that had the mechanical Omni capsule. That is a plastic ball designed to have it frequency dependent on how it's going to focus. So you start putting anything around something, it's going to operate differently than it intends to. Kate's asking a lot of questions about recording her vocals. Um, so Kate, Kate, t -t 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 -t. Kate, t -t 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 -t. that's Ben Folds. Oh, <laughs> I, he emailed me uh, recently. Really? Yeah, I was really excited. Wow. Ben Folds emailed me. And he, go, he goes, I, I think we met in, in, in Indiana. And I had to say, look, if I met you, Ben, I would have remembered. That's awesome. I would have remembered. I, I when I first it. met Eddie Van Halen years ago, he said to me, I think we've met. And I was like, trust me, if I'd met you before, I would have remembered. <laughs> but it's always, it's always nice when people To that it. story, there's a thing going back to John Lennon when Earl Slick was playing on Double Fantasy. They met before, during, sometime in New York. And John goes, we've met. And the guy goes, no, I would have remembered meeting John. Are you kidding? And he's yeah. like, no, we've met. And then Earl Slick remembered that he was absolutely hammered that week during that session. And, and he, he doesn't couldn't even remember meeting John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Eric does that to me all the time. Yeah. He's like, do I work here? Been here, been here for nine years. I think, do I work, I work here, don't I? So, oh, sorry, I'm just like, coming out of a nine-year buzz. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, yeah, Ben Folds is amazing. Um, yeah, he sent me a very, very nice Kate, email. Kate, back to your question. So, Sorry, we just so Kate, totally ADD'd ourselves. Yeah, totally. So, so for Kate, I, everybody's giving really good advice about uh, opening up the top end, 10 or 12K. You know, that definitely brings in the air. Um, high passing, yes, definitely you want to get out of the way. You don't need anything, probably. Definitely nothing below 50, probably nothing below 100. I mean, vocals, some people would say, oh, 300 is a great place to start for the lows on the vocals. Yeah, but it's all about the vocalist. For me, we typically, when I was working with R&B pop singers in like the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was doing more of those records, with girls I would do is use C12s. Because C12s have a bit more of a scoopy, smiley face. And they always seem to fill in the low end. And that's a, quite a famous mic for girl singers, use a C12. So it sort of, so, you know, Conversely, no matter what you've used as a vocal mic, yeah, you probably want to add a bit of air and you probably want to add a bit of extra low lows on the bottom. Um, however, one person's voice is not like anybody else's. Um, and... You know, it's a good plug-in for getting the bottom end if, if you get a vocal that's already high-passed or has no low end and you want to kind of smooth that out. The um, UAD 610 preamp plug-in and just slightly driving it in adds just the right amount of 100 120 thickness and then you can scoop some of that 250 i always scoop 250 most of the time it's multi-band that's just tucking it down but it does seem to work really well yeah it's great james rivera has posted the same comment six times um, we have A7Xs and we have the Shape 65s. And now that we have bought new computers, we're going to be able to try them side by side. So, Are they I, speakers? Speakers, yeah. I don't. I mean, I know you're the same way, Mark. I hate giving opinions on things that I haven't used. And so many times I go to forums and people are like debating something they've read or something they heard or a video they watched. Um, you've got to have a personal experience. So for me... I like the Focal Shape 65s, they sound fantastic. I haven't put the A7, A7Xs up yet, but I know that they are kind of a standard in that price range, pretty hard to beat. And they brought out these new ones called the TV7s or T7Vs. We have those as well. 
We're going to try those out. So once I've tried them out, I'll be able to answer the question. Otherwise, I'll just be talking out my butt. And... Here's the biggest piece of advice with speakers. Please. I think you could get away with pretty much any decent, modern, active speaker within reason. You just have to make sure that, like any speaker, you have to make sure that you're putting them in the room that is attracted to it, like it's responsive to it. And sometimes you would think, you know, you, you would go long way, so you put it over here, and you test it, and you just gotta spend, you gotta plan on spending a few days. Before you pull all your gear in, you gotta just start listening to speakers. Then you gotta pull your gear in so the speakers can respond to what's in the room. But you gotta really just make sure, and I'm talking millimeter moves make a million percent difference. Just doing, pulling it out from the speaker a little bit, pulling it into the wall. Sometimes the corners are your friend. Um, going back to Bill Schnee, he, I remember when he moved into his mixing room after the studio sold, he, they were trying to find the right place for speakers. And I think they went into the corners, which usually you wouldn't do. And he's like, they just worked there. The low mm -hmm. end really worked really for that room, worked really well for that room. So you, just because someone said, don't do that, you should try it. And I'm probably mm -hmm. the guy that says, don't do that. But I think just really spending time, they could be $300 speakers and spending the time making sure that the room and the speaker knows each other. I know it sounds cheesy, but you can really find the right space and then build around that your setup. Because traditionally you do stuff and you think, well, this is how everyone sets it up. Then you put a monitor between the speaker, instantly changes the sound. You can put it a little bit forward, instantly changes the sound. You can put a controller, flat screen in front of you, instantly change. There's so many variants that you do. You just got to keep an ear on that. Yeah, a lot of vocal discussions going on. So I can say I can 100% recommend um, Oak Sound Soothe 2, the version they're on now, as a... I have like three or four, maybe I, that's a good question for you. I have like three or four, like could mix anything as long as I've got these plugins. And, and number one would be Oak Sound Soothe because it could, it, it's just same as Spiff. Yeah. They're which just, I didn't get into until after I got the Soothe and now I can't live without it. That's a, yeah. And then for me, Waves MV2, because I can take like a really incredibly dynamic bass line, which normally I'm running at two or three compressors, maybe just in parallel. Bottom and do the bottom and top. Yeah. Amazing. And then the R bass. The R bass is just like, yeah. I Cheated. can use it, use it on anything. Bass, anything that needs some low end. Toms. Best Tom, Tom EQ ever. Yeah. So those those are like my, then you give me stock plugins in any DAW, I'm happy. I'm a fab filter guy, so I can do pretty much anything with that EQ3 because you can just do dynamic EQ. Yeah, well, wait, so wait, if you, if you pull too, up yeah. your default mm -hmm. EQ and compressor and Pro Tools, what is your default EQ and compressor? Do you have that set up where you have it assigned to specific things in Pro Tools? What do you mean, just have, have one just ready to go? There, in in preferences, you can assign mm -hmm. an EQ and a compressor so it's always at the top of your... I think sheet. we do. We actually have two of those things up there. I, one, the thing that happens is I spend more time demoing and doing stuff than I do, you know, yeah. So it, it becomes like a little redundant because that's I'm why I looking. put that up there. Yeah. So I, if I just need an EQ, it's the fat filters in there, and the MJUC is in there. Even though I don't even compress with that very much, it just has such a color tone. Obviously, if I wanted something fast and snappy, I'd get maybe 1176 or something. But there's just so many options now. Plugins, it makes me want to puke because I just I get into the devil's triangle where I spend so much time experimenting, which is fun, but then I go back to the exact same thing I would use the first time. And it's funny, I think I saw a video with Tom Lord Algae where he was using a Bomb Factory 1176 on a Weezer project, and I heard it, I'm like, that's the sound. That sounds amazing. So I pulled that back out, even though I haven't used that plug in 15 years, and that's in my template now, because it does sound amazing. So we forget that just because it's a good sounding compressor. It doesn't sound anything like an M76. Yeah. I had um, Gil, hey Gil, from Avid on a call last week, who's a great guy, and I teased him. 
I, you know, I was like going, yeah, you can get away with stock plugins, you know, like the 1176 by the Bomb Factory. And we just joked about how it's a great sounding compressor, but it's just a graphic. Ken Calais only uses the Bomb Factory and the Avid original EQ thing. Doesn't use pretty much anything else. Just those two things. Yeah, so, I, I mean, if it works, it works. It's recorded really well. It probably doesn't really matter, does it? Don't yeah. want too much coloration. Right. Um, um, so getting back to like vocal stuff, because there's lots of different questions, lots of people here asking about vocals. I, I feel like um, it's very tough to come up with one answer because people are asking about what about parallel compression, they're making suggestions of that. It's, uh, I, I think you'd have to hear the vocal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously I have a go-to chain that starts and DSing is crucial for me and parallel soothe is crucial for me for vocals you got to play around with the sharpness mm -hmm. because sometimes you want to have a little more edge to it um, my favorite color compressor for a vocal is still that mjuc mm -hmm. in the uh the third setting which looks like the uh the very uh the very muse slash stay level thing the mjuc if you don't have it buy it it's 27 dollars. we don't get any any uh it's been 27 dollars special price since it came out I've, which i'm wondering why Klinghelm hasn't done more i mean he just probably is just like i don't need to this is I, whenever i talk about he it he just he completed his mission which was create one of the best sounding plugins in history it's one of the best sounding plugins ever i reviewed it with um matt baudreau from working class audio we both reviewed it and Cl mr Klinghelm, i can't remember his name um Klanghelm means sound helmet for anybody that uh, um, is he German? He's German. He sent me the nicest email. He said, you, he said to me, you, I think you're the first person who's ever reviewed my product who didn't ask for it for free. And I was like, it's $27. Right. Support. So it, and it is the most honest review of anything. Because, and it was um, just because I'd heard about it. Matt Baudreau heard about it. And we're like, hey, we've been hearing these good things about this new plugin. It's like five years ago. We both tried it out. And we're like, this is the best $27 I've ever spent on a plugin in my life. It's the best drum room mic compressor on the yeah. first setting you switch it to limit because the because the dark you can you can drive yeah. it hard and, and dark then the, the edgy oh, and get gosh, rid of all the cymbal bleed oh so great but it has that really edgy i don't know if it's a fair child sound but it's it could be it's very beatly regardless yeah. of whatever it is somehow the response of it is and it sounds it's funny because i'll use that and then i'll pull out the uad fair child for a piano and I won't use the MJUC because for some reason, obviously there's some character elements going on in all these different companies that have their different plugins that are similar, but they just sound better mm -hmm. on different instruments, always. Yeah. Man, there are a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's the free version that doesn't have quite the same amount of things, but if you want to get into it, but trust me, Spend the twenty-seven dollars. Support the guy because he literally came out with something that's still, after almost ten years, just like it, yeah, it's perfection. A yeah, I met so many people that freak about that. Jennifer says, pulling out my hair with too much mid-range recording or warmer mic. Suddenly, those compressors. I realized the thin sound was actually just super bright. Um, I mean, if I'm get people send me stuff to mix, I'm used to printing compression as I go in. I just am used to it. I don't EQ at all ever, unless I'm high passing because I'm in a low rumbly room with AC or something. Otherwise just print it flat, do all the EQ afterwards. But I do like compressing on the way in because I like the singer to kind of react to that. If you get just a, some gentle compression, they can get up close, they can feel the warmth in their voice. They can belt a little bit and not scare themselves because they're clipping. You know, I, I, I like a little bit going in, but often I get- singers like to sing autotune now. Oh yeah, lots of them I, it's for that specific sound for the production of you know, pop records and stuff. Yeah, and it's amazing if you take it off. It's like they're like they can't sing, but it's not because of pitch. It's the it's almost like a comfort blanket or something right. where they can just. It's weird. I mean, it's the same as, you know. I remember when Bill Schnee did that. He did something with Barry Manilow. And I remember he needed a specific sound in his earphones, the SBX90, specific reverb, and a specific EQ. So he could specifically hear 
obviously something different than what we are hearing and what you're printing. And I think just performance when you're monitoring is super crucial. So I know some people, they put in like a super compressor in line in the headphones so it can pump. I mean, think about day in a life, John Lennon would sing to the tape echo completely different than if there was no tape echo and they added the echo after. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it's that. A lot of people don't have that luxury, but I think they do with, not to plug UAD too much today, but with that unison, they can do a lot of front end stuff where you're going in, even just tapping a little bit with an LA-2A or something is just way better because sometimes when you're going into a note as your a mic singer, cutting in it maybe? No, the mic's fine. The battery died and can fix it. On your end? Yeah. So I think a lot of it is when you're singing as a singer, I have had experience of this, when you're starting to push notes and your confidence goes bad, you go flat. So mm -hmm. if you're pushing a note and it's coming too hard in your ear or something, you might be a little timid and you, you go a little flat. So if you have some kind of compression on the front end, it gives you a little bit of a comfort. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, well, I feel like we're opening such a can of worms on vocals because I really do have to say, the only thing I could recommend without hearing somebody's voice is Soothe. It's the only technique I could recommend. Because if you use Soothe, again, they are not paying me to say this. So what is were. the other I can, gloss, about hearing what's somebody's the other voice, plugin? How am I supposed to say what's what? What's that other come? fixing plugin? Gloss, gloss? Oh, I mean, there's... Oh, Golfos. Golfos. So that's very different. Someone's asked me that. What's the difference between those two? And I can say I have both. Um, the Golf or whatever the, the G one is. It's Golfos, yeah. It's a little more automatic. It doesn't, it's just different. So the Sooth plugin, which is another one of those, like, it should have won a tech award. I don't know if it has. Or a technical Grammy or something. Because yeah, yeah. it's one of those plugins that can literally, you get a file that's if super a cringy. Award. Then Golfos can. Jeez. I mean, then Oak Sound can. You can turn it up, and it ends <laughs> up sounding absolute. Is it gold? Yeah, I thought gold. they were Look. clear. No, they're gold. That's so crazy. I thought they were clear. Yeah. But it's one of those plugins that literally, there is a, I might do a video of how you can literally transform digital overheads to tape overheads, just with two settings on Soothe. Yeah, yeah. And it, even if they're like really cheap, kind of pencil condensers in a crappy room with I, crappy I totally, symbols. I totally respect them as a company as well. It's because, amazing. Because their products, not cheap and not overly expensive, but I think it's like $170 or $100. They put so much time into yeah. figuring it out that it's worth it. And they're a small company and, and everybody always says, can you get us a discount? And I was like, I'd love to be able to, but they're just a small company. I mean, they brought out Soothe, which killed it and everybody loved. And then they updated it and made it even better. Right. And then so, the Spiff which a lot of people don't even know exists, but it is the king of all kings for transient design because it allows you to do 40 times. But that, stopping right there, correct myself, there is obviously other things like um, Softube has this transient designer that looks like an old tune, guitar tuner, mm. metronome thing, don't know. that has its, a limiter in it. And it's it's kind of frequency-based, but totally more analog-y where it's one knob. And that sounds very different than SPIF. And that works really good on side stick snare over TransX, over Transient Designer, over the SPIF. So again, there's plugins that will always win even if there's one that's really good at the overall picture. Yeah. So that's the only, that's the only plugin without hearing somebody's voice that I can recommend. Because if you're, uh, or and only... And even though it's expensive, somebody's saying it's over two hundred dollars now because um, they make the new one. Um, this is how I see that. Okay, so I understand because there's so much content and stuff coming out that you're like, how is that? It's like the subscription thing where mm -hmm. everyone's like, I can't, I can't. I mean, I just looked at all my sub like streaming subscriptions and added it up. I'm like, I cannot be paying this amount for stuff I turn on Disney Plus for an hour a month. When you buy something that has a, an incredible value to it, so let's say there's a plugin that's two hundred dollars versus thirty nine dollars with a coupon, and it's really good, you go, 
just like the MJUC. So if the MJUC was $300, I would have bought it in a second. But it's $27. But the difference was mm -hmm. knowing that when you know it's something good, it's going to last long. You got to mm -hmm. demo it first. That's why a lot of these companies offer the demos. But with the SU plugin, I can guarantee you, um, you'll probably be using that for a few years. Yeah. Exclusively. Yeah. And the over the everything. And the thing is, I got into it early, but late. Yeah. I got into it early. I've been using it for a few years. However, I got into it late because I was going around interviewing people. And they and all I, talked about everybody it. Everybody talked about it. Yeah. Completely unsolicited. And all of them have bought it. And nobody got paid. And when they did a, they did their little ad for it, um, like a year ago, they took four of our people that had been interviewed, asked our permission, but, and edited it in. All oh, people quotes. unsolicited yeah. that said, "Oh yeah, my favorite plugins are like." Su, 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 su. And the reason why I recommend it, again, not getting paid, is because you. So what you could do, um, um, Jennifer and someone's Kate, going to start calling me Mark Soothe Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> What you can do is you can take a vocal and where you're saying it sounds too thin or it sounds too aggressive or it sounds too much, too much low mids or too much low end. You just put it on and you just find those areas and you will see the peaks and troughs, you know, going on and be, oh, wow, there's a huge like amount. And you can sit there and just adjust it and start dynamically controlling those peaks. And suddenly you can make your vocal sound a little bit more pleasant, a little bit more even. Then what you can do is you can take any EQ, I don't care if it's Logic, Cubase, Nuendo, Pro Tools, blah, 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 any stock EQ, and then brighten the overall thing after it to fit into the track. Do a bit of high pass in the fit. And then there's this whole conversation about what's the best EQ. Well, that's when your ears come in, because your ears come in, you've got the vocal now playing in the track, there's no more like harsh areas and low mid build up, and you can brighten it to fit in the track. and who knows what's going to work best? Um, the people that can mix songs with the vocal first are magic. Yeah. I don't know how they can do that. And I, I, I'm wondering about that a lot the last few years, about the way I kind of bring in instruments, the timing, like drums, bass, guitars, rhythms. Vocal is always at the end. I try to start with the vocal and get the vocal sounding amazing and then building the track around that. It just doesn't work. But the guys that are able to do that are just magnificent at getting these great vocal sounds. So maybe that's the payoff is like, do you really want a vocal centric song where the rhythm is taking a back seat, or do you want the opposite? I try to get for both, but it's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Jack is asking a question, which is very similar to what we talked about um, on our last Q&A. Do you have any advice for breaking into the, into the industry? Now, Brack, uh, Jack, I believe, is vision impaired. Is that correct? I think he was saying earlier. And we have quite a few members of our academy um, that also um, have uh, our vision impaired as well. And it doesn't, I mean, we do music. So... It hasn't stopped quite a few of those. Somebody actually wrote a book um, and sent it to me a couple of months ago, and I've got to we've got to talk about it. It's sitting in the thing. Oh, the yeah. So we'll talk about that book so we can give you a bit more advice. But as far as like, I mean, obviously this is the best time in the world to be working remotely. I mean, it's how how many it. how many customers do you, clients do you get that actually come to your studio now? Two a month. Yeah. I mean, I I. I get asked more than I allow. Yeah. Just because I, I've gotten so used to I mean, I'm pretty ADHD, so right. I'm bouncing all over the place. I, I like to take a break when I want to take a break. Yeah. And if I can, I can. I just work way better. Yeah. But I mean I can work with somebody in the room. I just I I tend to just seem to be able to work better when I'm in the, the headspace that I want to be in. So if I go out and weed whack for a half hour in the middle of <laughs> mixing a track i do that which i'm sure my neighbor's like does this guy ever work but it's like i think a lot of it is just the the idea that are we are we not on hello hello no no we're working I know. <laughs> did you just unplug me oh i think a lot of it is just based <laughs> on um you know if the client really insists on being there but here's the the idea that i have these people come into a room thinking that they're going to be in this perfect sounding room and there's not a thing 
as a perfect sounding room. So they come in, you're used to the way your room sounds, but I might come in here and check mixes and I'm like, there is an absolute honkiness at 300. Or they're sitting on the couch behind you. Sure. So they're making all these judgments based on what they're hearing instead of being in their car, which might not be sexy or beautiful sounding, but at least they know it. Same as their headphones. So I try to keep them in their own universe as much as they can because they can take it. On top of it, they're making creative decisions on the spot if they're attending. So most of the time is they, they're getting all the way to their last recall they'll come in versus you know coming in right after the mix is done or being there for the mix. It's just, I, I feel like you, you lose a lot. It's something better to have somebody be able to sit on a mix for a week and listen to it on three different days because you can take a first listen of a mix after a horrible phone call with somebody and be in a bad mood and make all these decisions based on that, write it down, and then listen to the same song in a week and be completely different based on your headspace. Yeah, I think so. So, so with all of that in mind, because that's incredibly inform informative. I mean, the reality is, Jack, for getting clients, um, you first of all, you're doing the right thing. You're in a community. You're communicating with other people. Um, you need to get yourself out there. Collaboration is key. You need to be able to collaborate with people. Um, and um, <laughs> watch. Eric. Audio movers is great. <laughs> Zoom is great. There's a lot of just amazing options now that happened during the pandemic where to be able to be creative. Um, I like to, I love getting emails and I've said this a lot where I love it when it's like an itemized list of issues. Mm -hmm. And I hate it when they're just like, it's not sitting right. And usually if I get into if recall- If it could be more blue. Yeah. <laughs> By getting a recall three, four, five, something's wrong with me. It's not what they're hearing. It's that I didn't translate what their vision was. So um, the communication is key. And I don't mind if there was 70 problems with if snares here needs to be here. The guitar should go a little wider here. That is awesome. Because all I'm here is the conduit to get that music across to the audience for their vision. Um yeah, there's nothing worse than saying it's a little moody sounding. I, I got, I, I need it to be a little less moody. And you're like, is that reverb? Is that the drums aren't punchy enough? Because sometimes making a mix a little irritating is absolutely perfect. Even if it's harsh, it gets what you're trying to do is get some kind of emotion out of you. So putting a little bit of tension in it or whatever is okay. Um, I think uh, you, the question that's being asked about you mixing Jeremy Day's album um, Many Thousand Away is sort of being answered here. Who's that? Um, Soentka Lunt. Okay. Um, she, I mean... Are they, are they German? I'm not sure. Maybe. Is it a German artist? German band. Actually, German band. really oh, okay. amazing band from Hamburg. Right. They, were, they were really big in the 90s, early 90s. And they so, came back right before COVID. Right. And they did this album. What was the question? Just how was it working with them, seeing as you were a thousand ways, miles away from each other? Oh, it was amazing. So the keyboardist lives in LA, but it was COVID. So I just mixed it. Dirk, the singer, is in Hamburg. The rest of the guys are in Germany. And, you know, I did a first pass. They listened. They spent two weeks listening. They compiled notes. They had one guy send notes back instead of, you know, 15 emails of chains of all different people. And it worked out amazing. There was some minor little things that needed to be fixed in the beginning. I mixed half that record in Arizona on iLouds with analog gear. And I did all the finals back in LA and it was perfect. That's what I'm saying, like headphones, iLoud speakers, cheap speakers. If you know what you're getting out of it, you're good. Um, being asked we've upgraded, yes, we have upgraded to the Ultra. We have two of them, just got them. So we're gonna put one in the main control room and one in the bedroom studio in the What's house. What's an Ultra? The That's studio? the M1 Ultra Studio, yep. So. That's gonna be slick. Yeah, I'm very excited. 
and a fraction of the cost of the other one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I could sell it and save a couple dollars and get the other one. I'd be losing, but I, I mean, I, it really kicked ass for two years. So I'm pretty happy. And if it is that much better, I would mind doing that. Yeah, I'll let you know. Well, you can come by and use it. Is everything compatible on M1 yet? Pro Tools is. Yeah. Is all plugin developers crossed over finally? Waves definitely is. UAD definitely is. I think all the ones that we use, yeah. Cool. Um, so there's tons and tons of tons of questions here. I'm just streaming, I'm going through. Um, nice cast. You ever use that? Nice cast. Some kind of streaming service. Ah. Uh -uh. I think that was something. Maybe that was something Brower used to use like ten years ago. I yeah. Think. I mean, there was patches, and then there was like whatever Peter Jackson used for Lord of the Rings. Oh, I know, a, I know who that is. That's um, and then there's whatever the other one that was everyone was using from. Chicago. Well, there's a new one that's out that's being used by all the movie studios, and it's actually a friend of mine. Uh, it's her husband's company in Chicago. No, they're in uh, they're in Phoenix. They're in Phoenix. They're in Arizona, and they. They're the ones that all the, the movie studios are using, and they're trying to do one that audio guys and girls can get into. Yeah, Adam, you met Adam, the score mm -hmm. guy. Hollywood Strings, their company has this software that they designed that's incredible, that they can do score sessions mm -hmm. with a producer or somebody away. And it's similar to Zoom and Audio Movers combined, where they literally can hit the button and talk back to the entire orchestra from your home. I mean, it's getting so insane. It's bound to happen that Avid or somebody's going to finally buy out one of these software companies mm -hmm. and it's just going to be seamless. And it's just yeah. going to be a video thing. You connect your monitor to it and the latency thing is going to get all figured out. And it's just going to, I mean, that's the biggest issue is the latency between here and when you're doing real time. But yeah, I've done stuff with like Blackbird where I was doing audio movers and it worked really great where I just had the camera going. Yeah. And we just we've done all the movies a few times. It's been 50 50 for us. Yeah. I teach sometimes using audio movers and sometimes it drops it, out. Yeah. Yeah. I know this one that um, I think it's I think it's being beta tested by quite a few people. Um, so, like I said, it's designed Stay for tuned. movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and all these things are always dependent on connection. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so sometimes you get to test out a new piece of software streaming and you're like, it's not working properly. And it's probably because the Internet's absolutely awful. Um, keep your thoughts about distortion and saturation. I mean, it's such a general question. And I think we've talked about it quite a few times during this call, especially early on. Um, you know, there was something inherent about analog gear that would add these things. And we joke about it because I was talking to John Curland uh, a couple of days ago. You know, everything they were doing at Abbey Road was to try and remove as much distortion and saturation as possible to get the cleanest possible signal tone, so they could signal, so they could they could hear the tone of the instrument as it was yeah. originally recorded. And now, of course, that we're in That's digital, why they would rip out all the transformers and the tape machines here, at, like producers workshop yeah. for all the Steely Dan records, and try yeah. to get the cleanest sound possible and avoid all that static problems that a tape machine supposedly had, but we miss that. It's funny, it's what I was saying last night to you. It's like, if you're gonna have a tape machine, you might as well have one that's crappy. Because sure. if you're gonna go for that effect, you should go for that effect instead of trying to get this incredibly beautiful Revox or you know a gorgeous mastering studio, Studer machine or an ATR right. machine that's just gorgeous. Well, I think, I think, I agree with you, but I do think a lot of the problem is things not being used incrementally. Most of the time, I see tape plugins being used. Let's put them on a master bus. No, I mean, that's just, yeah. you know, what I love about tape, and we heard the difference when we've tracked, a ta tracked on tape uh, with Aerosmith on tape and then not on tape. The drums were just massively different. The yeah. bass was massively different. But we were talking like with, with Tom's bass, we had five inputs. We had a DI, we had a distortion box, we had a close mic, we had a, 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 a cab, miking a cab, and then I can't remember the fifth thing that Jack had me do, but we do all these things and then blend. And that's all hit and tape and all yeah. got a low end bump. 
And then by the time you come to mix it, you're like, oh, this is lovely. I've got all this beautiful low end. Drums, all the high end was really super smooth. Everything had like a kind of a big bump on the toms and the kick. And it was, But tr that's, you know, maybe 24 tracks of being hit to tape. Yeah. You can't just stick a master, put a, a Studa, you know, to a Revox, whatever, tape plug in on, the, on your bus and go, why doesn't it sound like it was recorded on 24 track tape? Because it wasn't. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's funny, the Etch-a-Sketch or Sketch, sketch Cassette plug-in, yeah. which is a super amazing, like, four-track cassette plug-in, sounds more like tape to me, the options that it gives you, than probably any of the tape saturators. Yeah, I believe. Just because it's got so many options and you're going for this effect versus yeah. it being this beautiful... You know, I do use the ATR on my master, but it's only because I like the high EQ yeah. stuff instead of using a, a shelf. It's just really pretty. I think, honestly, um, to answer your saturation thing, um, Mac DSP analog channel is still one of the best plugins ever made. Just, you can, it's, it doesn't use that much DSP. You could pretty much open it up on 40 channels and just sit there and adjust it and get some low bump maybe a bit of beautiful high end, whatever you want to do, and then just copy and paste it across all your channels and then start mixing. And it's just going to eat up a little bit of the transients, give it a little bit of extra warmth, just make your high end a little bit silkier and prettier. You know, I, I know um, I know Massey Tapehead used to be perfect for that, but... Um, oh yeah, the Tapehead, that was 99 bucks. That yeah. was cheap. But I think he stopped supporting it. Wasn't there a problem with... Yeah, yeah. Because Mark Endo used to put it on pretty much every channel, but then when Analog Channel came out, actually it was before that, and Mark, Mark's told me that's the one to use. So when you're talking about saturation and distortion, there's two conversations here. There's the obvious stick a freaking you know um, decapitator on it, Sans amp, whatever, and futz box by Mac DSP, and just like completely destroy something. That's one level of saturation distortion. Devil lock. Devil yeah. lock. Yeah. And then the other one is what we're talking about, which is just gentle, gentle analog emulations. I can't remember the Clang Helm. Satin. Satin's a great. What's the Clang Helm distortion box? SD2 or something like that. Yeah. That thing is incredible because it gives you yeah. tube, transistor, digital, yeah. all these little algorithms that are mimicking. Same as like the traditional lo-fi Avid plugin that you could just do 0.1% and it just does this pointy thing that's just beautiful. So yeah. there's that harmonic sound and the distortion sound. But I do believe that, you know, just like anything, creating your own kind of distortion, if that's with a real physical box you're going in and out of, you're going to be way more unique by having that character. That's why using, you know, guitar pedals and stuff for your sounds is really mm -hmm. in fashion now because you can really get deep with creative sounds that are very unique versus... As much as I love the decapitator, which I do love still, it is yeah. very a specific sound, and it sounds very specific. Yeah, I, do, I, I don't remember ever saying that uh, the analog channel is a distortion. It's a tape emulation, so it gives you the EQ settings of a, a, of a tape. Um, so, um, but yeah, if you're looking, I would start with that. You're either going to use... Analog channel is distortion, by the way. It's a billion percent. Yeah, There's so much distortion in analog... We just think of it as good. It was why the whole universe of the hi-fi universe tries so hard spending billion dollars trying to get that out. So it's pure and clean. And I think music, rock and roll, all of that is based on distortion. Everything. Tape, distortion. Old tubes, distortion. All these elements are creating distortion. Just because it says distortion doesn't mean it's bad or it is broken or it's harsh. It's just meaning that there's some overtones and some harmonic changes that are creating this harmony. And I don't know. <laughs> We're turning into Cisco and Ebert. I know. Uh, Karen Ball, MJUC. Yay, Karen. Um, again, not sponsored by them. Although I do think he's a lovely guy. When I got that email, I was very, very happy. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. So really, like to getting back to the point, there is... When you're talking about saturation and distortion, there's two conversations. It's like, is it using hardware like, you know, 1073, which has got a transformer sound, seems to get a little bit extra weight. I'm not going to say warmth. I just did, but, you know, some weight to it. Is it 
is it tubes and stuff that are adding it or are you talking about like literally distorting it so it's audibly you know crunched and all that stuff um you know um yeah maybe sergo but i didn't say that so um i wasn't saying that it was adding distortion now the analog channel is is emulating the analog channel the max ds1 is emulating the frequency response of a tape machine and it's a great way to start off, especially with very digital sounding recordings, DIs and things like that. Just start with that before you put anything on. That's really how I'd recommend it. And as far as like actual like distortion, distortion, I mean, I, I, I personally like what the MJUC does because it has that drive and it never gets unbearable. Even when you put it up to maximum, it's still really sweet sounding. So try the MJUC. As I say, it's twenty-seven dollars. We should tell these people, like, give us some money for pushing your products. No, I'm just. <laughs> no, it's we're not we're not much use if we're if if we're we're only pushing stuff that's paid. We're not doing we're not pushing guitars. You want to get really creative? You can go out and buy even. You can find any kind of line amp or any box that was analog. And push it. And go in and come out and come back and have it your own sound. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is just, I don't know. I would, I, I don't like pushing too many things to get you into these like pigeonholes to only do this and only do that. But I do feel like there's so many cool ways to get yeah. sounds that people go, how'd you do that? Or what did you do? And it's like the cheesiest, easiest way to do it, which is like going into a four track or just go on reverb and buy. I mean, this is radical, but. Like I'm tempted because I know for a fact the old mini disc recorders have a specific sound and I'm already tempted to possibly go and maybe even start printing some things to that. It's harsh, but the way it has this super edgy punch mm -hmm. is incredible for something like a synthesizer in a trailer. Can't believe I'm even going there, but there's so many character driven processes that does not apply in plugin land the way that the character of a plugin is versus an analog it's still different and there's mm -hmm. something creative about touching stuff and pushing it and committing and walking away that is super super fun yeah, yeah. it's all about having fun i say that every day like we're not having fun what's the point like i did not get into this business to not have fun. If I was gonna get into that, I would have become crane operator. I don't know. Yeah. Um, somebody's talking about cracked plugins. No, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, not only do I not recommend don't do it. cracking plugins because they will cause all kinds of problems. You know, we talk about, so we our computer down here that we do live streaming on very often with mixing and with ScreenFlow running and tons of other software is a 2009 cheese grater Mac. And we run Pro Tools on it, and I think we had one crash with all of those softwares running at once, which is ridiculous when you're trying to run Pro Tools or any DAW. Why would you run multiple softwares? We have one crash in 11 years or something like that, but I still have to deal with everybody telling me that Pro Tools crashes all the time. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, um, you know what I mean? Here's the thing. Before you would ever buy a, a cracked software, if you're in such a hard place where you can't physically afford it, reach out to the company and explain your case because, I mean, these people want you to make music. They, they're obviously a company and stuff, but do not crack software. Like, don't do it. There's no point. And there really isn't a point to be able to be 30,000 plugins deep anyways because it's going to end up constraining your creativity because you're trying to debate if you're going to use 16 different 1176s. So just just don't do it. It's not worth it. Yeah, definitely. And to be honest, I, like, I, like I was saying right in the beginning, there's only really three slash four plugins that, that I would have to have in order to do my job, to buy. The rest of them just come stock with, the, with, with DAWs. I like different flavors. It's fun. And I get to do... I get to have fun, but it doesn't actually stop me getting a really great mix. Yeah, I mean, I, I get, I get that. I, my template is a little different because I have the reverbs set up 
ready to go. So if I wanted to make right. a reverb sound like this, it's there. Sure. And but in general, you're right. Like if you open up the tracks itself before the buses, most of them are all fab filter EQ. That's it. It's nothing too radical. Um, let's have a look at others. Just picked up some old rat gear from a friend who was selling some stuff, old DBX compressors. Looking forward to having new uh, gear to work with. Lovely. There's enough free stuff out there, says uh, Cry9C, so new need to crack. Um, you don't know how to manage the simple stuff, then make sure... Yeah, I agree. Learn how to use what you do have. You know, getting... Spending... I mean, getting back to the point. I think an MV2 and R bass and Soothe 2, and I'm pretty much, and now come to think of it, throw an MJU, sent MJUC for the saturation and the compression. Those are the only things I would need, and I could probably mix without any of them and still get good results. But give me those four, it's going to be pretty much, yeah. You know, so, yeah. It's it's one of the, it's one of those things. It's like if you're looking to try and expand your plugins and get hundreds and hundreds of different flavors, um, it's going to probably stop you from getting good at your job because you're going to spending so much time auditioning. It's a bit like DSing. I always say to people, if there's some really bad S's in the song, turn them down. Oh yeah, but I tried this plugin or that plugin. I'm like, you can literally spend 20 minutes auditioning plugins to remove three or four S's when you could have just kind of gone in there and went. I do feel like a hypocrite in the sense of saying, don't get a, you don't need the plugins because I, I do use a lot and I love plugins, but I do think that, I mean, geez, compared to like 2004, when you would pay a thousand dollars for just the Waves SSL bundle, just that, I mean, the fact that you can get, you know, let's say a monthly bundle of all the updated plugins for $30 is pretty insane. You don't have to get all different companies but there is a way better option than it used to be when it comes to it. And I like plugins and I like to try new plugins, but I do probably only use 5% of the plugins I have over and over and over. Right, right, totally. Tons of great questions. God, I'm getting really hungry. Seventh, cir seventh Circle Audio for cheaper hardware gear. Don't know it, do you know Seventh Circle Audio? Yeah, Seventh seven Circle, hmm. I think so. Hardware, right? Yeah, I don't know it though. Um, I have to try it out. Somebody asked me about head speakers. We tried many, many times to get head speakers, and we just seem to get that that we to try out, and and it all seem, always seems to go nowhere. We even had the owner write to us say, "Do it," and I was like, "Yeah." I was like, "I'll copy you to the American side." And um, head, yeah, head, and it always just I don't know. It never never seems to stop. Yeah, and it never seems to get going. Um, but I'm, I love trying out all speakers. I, for me, people always say, oh, Warren, you're positive about products you try out. I am positive, but I always keep it very specific about is, are you the person? I try to identify the person that would love a product. But at the same time, I'll tell you, I get sent a lot of stuff that we don't do. We had an interface sent to us a few years ago. You know, all know the story that was so bad and was quite pricey and didn't review it, and then I went to Julian Klaus's site. Julian, I hope you're well. Um, and he reviewed it and said why it was bad, because he sat there and tested it and found out it was noisy and distorted badly and all this kind of stuff. And so often we just, something is just not good, so we don't review it. Because sometimes, you know, because I am the person that's gonna review something and find out what it could be good for, I, I just felt like this particular product would just be a really a horrible disaster for me to even um, uh, do. Uh, Hair Leifer says, does British and American mixes sound different? Yes. Yes. Um, the first thing I really noticed between American uh, radio to British radio was really always drums. Like when I first moved to America, I remember turning on the radio and being like, wow, the kick drum's 3 dB too loud. It's, and now, of course, I mix far more drum heavy. But you, you go back and listen to like, you know, British rock records and American rock records. There's a massive difference in how it I'm is. just trying to think of, you know, Ken Scott did a ton of the biggest 70s records. Jeff Emmerich did pretty much all of the Beatles records. And, you know, they're, they're very specific to 
training from Abbey Road. We talked about that last yeah, night. Yeah, the drums are in, of, more in the mix, far more they, in the mix. They kind of, yeah, all from Norman Smith, pretty much. Yeah. And you then you listen to, like, the Eagles or Fleetwood Mac, yeah. which is why I started mixing. Yeah. And the drums are always, that's probably why my snares are always 15 dB too loud. Is because <laughs> you listen to these records and the, the drums are surrounding the vocal. And it's just something I like. But I, the other thing to think about is, I remember this marketing tactic that Mackie used to do on the Mackie D8B back in 2000. You could choose British EQ or American EQ. And it was curves. It was basically the difference between probably API curve and either a Neve or an SSL curve. But at the time, I thought it was genius marketing. I thought it was like, oh, this is going to make it sound more British. I'm going to use that. Because I like, I like that. Oh, my God. And it now sounds like Paul McCartney singing. <laughs> Genius. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely uh, more low end in American stuff than we were. There's a huge difference between the 70s, 80s era New York versus L.A. sound. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. cities had their own specific sound. I'm I mean, listen to it. Motown. All about the New York sound. To me, to me the 70s. American records that I love are all New York based. Something yeah. Phil Spector said, mm -hmm. and Larry Levine, who was his engineer, they would talk about echo chambers. And this is going back to finding your own one thing that is your sound. Like echo chambers were personality of all these records. So you listen to Motown versus the Gold Star standard of Phil Spector albums. They all had their own sound because they're all using like bathrooms and stuff for their own echo chambers, which is creating these sonic character sounds. The one thing I would like to see a plugin do really well is that tape distortion sound that you hear in like the Motown records or all these kind of, even the Muscle Shoals sounding records where it's like this crunchy tape sound, it's like Percy Sledge distorting a microphone or something's going on. I haven't heard a plugin do that yet. I would love to be able to hear that. And I know it's possible to do still physically because there was a studio in Chicago called High Style. And it was a tube base, old vintage style recording studio, eight channels, tube, tape machine that sounded like old Rockabilly studios. And it sounded exactly like that sound. There's a record, Paul Seymour record I mixed that they tracked there that sounds exactly like that it sounds like the old kind of era even like the band when they were doing stuff at a and r in new york that era this distortion added with chambers was super unique to each studio that eventually when everyone started getting ssl it started sounding the similar and same and i think that's when it started to kick off where this guy specifically became almost as important to an album as a producer or an engineer was having the, the right console. It's yeah. just interesting. Yeah, I agree. All of those things are huge. I, I, I find myself saying this a lot recently, but to sort of back up your idea, I mean, Dave Jordan said to me, and, uh, and, and Brian echoed this, his uh, engineer, it's like they, they became better engineers when they got better gear. It's just the reality is, is like, you know, you, you learn your skill set, but you, you are limited by, by by equipment, but these days, all bets are off. I mean, the entry level on gear is so good. Yeah. Um, Steve Klein, the other day when we interviewed him, talked about room acoustics, he talked about speakers, and he said, you know, those $300 speakers there are, you know, the, the for instance, like the Callies, the $300 yeah. pair of speakers are better than the, the $5,000 speakers of 20 years ago. Yeah. It's like the, the what we understand and, how, and the ability that we have to measure stuff now. Somebody was talking about plugins and measuring them stuff. It's just insane how accessible it is. So you can design a product and measure it and make it as flat as possible. And for hundreds of dollars, you get something that used to cost thousands of dollars of hit and miss to do. We do need to come back from that because we live in a society of options. You can go sure. on Amazon and literally have it the next day. It's like last night, you're like, how much is a hammock? I'm like, $100 on Amazon. And like yeah. literally get a hammock the next day where... 25 years ago, you'd have to go to Walmart or someplace that had the quickest hammock. So with gear and it's all down to technology too, where everything is, 
you can get it fast. And I feel like creatively that is limiting us just as much as not having the gear. So we yep. have to kind of come into that full circle of trying to. I agree. I don't know, I'm a big hypocrite when it comes to that. I got to really watch it when I'm trying to like, oh, I don't need that. Just because <laughs> I have it, I got to learn to be able to be okay with certain things. Because making records back when I was 15 on that Task Camp 424, didn't have anything. Yep. And you listen back to that and you're just like, the vibe is way better than anything I get now. I'm going to uh, jump in on, I was, I was answering a couple of questions with, with uh, you know, by typing them out, but I want to get in what Peter's saying. Um, somebody was asking about inexpensive first compressor. I, I would say, and I, all the, all the, you know, experts are going to hate me for saying this, that some of those 1176 clones are just fantastic sounding. 1176 itself is not an expensive component compressor. Um, my good friend Michael Stucker at Indiana University has all his students build an LM76 clone as part of their, um, you know, degree. And they all sound fantastic. So honestly, if you want a good utility, entry-level hardware, most of those clones, I haven't shot them all out, but I've been in many, many studios with an LM76 clone, and I put it on the snare drum and said, pretty much sounds like LM76 I'm used to. And then like, how much was that? Like 350. I'm like... You know, it's if you want to get in, just get yourself one of those. I'm sure there's a lot of companies that, to make them that are, that are very affordable. Christopher says AudioScape 1176. Um, somebody else said a Clark Technic one. I mean, yeah, get yourself a nice compressor on the way in. Remember that it's not about, you know, it's about how it sounds. So just because it might not sound 100% authentic to the original, it's still compressing. And there still might be a difference between the hardware and the plug-in. I will always push Audioscape because I think they make amazing stuff. Right. But the difference that they do is they put a tiny bit more time into on maybe cutting corners in different areas to make sure the components are a little better. Yeah. And it does show that it works a lot better there. Um, what, uh, what was interesting is like, you know, Paul Wolf's a good friend. I'm sure you know Paul as well. And he... He said to me, Tone Lux. yeah, I mean, he's insane. I mean, you know, he API to Tone owned Lux, API yeah. and designed stuff for API and designed this, the, the slate preamp that goes with the microphone and, and there's hundreds of things. Yeah. Uh, almost every company I know that's remaking something hires him to make sure it's done well. So there's not really anybody better in our business than Paul Wolf when it comes to, to hardware. You know, Paul, if you're watching, you rock. Um, we love Paul. And he said to me something very, very important, because when we went into the whole tariff thing, you know, about three years ago before the pandemic, he's like, it's not just hurting. He's like, the problem is, is like most, not most, a good proportion of electronics that people use to make equipment is only made in China now. Yeah. It's not a case of like, we can only we want to buy a European, because even if you're buying a European made thing, an American made thing, a British made thing, an Australian, whatever, whatever, Canadian, whatever it might be, they're still using Chinese components because some of these resistors and capacitors or whatever are so inexpensive that they're only made in those factories. Right. So we were kind of hurting ourselves by putting on those tariffs. Now, I'm not talking politics. I have no reason. I'm just saying when you buy your 1176 clone, it is 99.9% .9 sure that that has the same components as the one that's five times the price. Now, it doesn't mean there's not a couple of components in there that are going to be very unique to it. Maybe an American-made or British-made transformer. Don't get me wrong, but the bulk of that stuff is going to use exactly the same components. So, And that's if you really want to get into that stuff. I'm not the guy, but there are many smart guys out there will tell you which components you can swap out. You can buy cheap microphones and swap out a couple of key components and suddenly boom up, up your stuff so my point is is like don't be too afraid of the price and, and I, I think everybody should have a, a hardware compressor on the way in on, on many sources and a, and a good 1176 clone is probably not a bad way of going but if you want one compressor only and budget's not a problem probably a distressor it's like the swiss, yeah. swiss army knife of compressors yeah, yeah. i don't have one but then i don't need it because i have la2a's uh, crown, you know, I mean, I have every compressor that it does. 1176s, DB 65s, um, Spectrasonics, Neve, 
you know, I don't, I don't need a Swiss Army knife because I'll just use the. I love love the stressors. Yeah. Yeah, they're amazing. Phenomenal. So if it's not about price, it's funny that was considered like a new clone, and then that became historic. Yeah, it's it's a classic. Yeah. It's the most. Yeah, and I don't own one. I should probably own one just because I talk about them all the time. Um, Nick says the KT-76, which is a Clark Technics one, to him is indistinguishable from the original. Again, I love UAD as a company. I'm not trying to say don't buy their stuff. Um, headphone mixing, I already answered that in the thing. We, I said we mix on headphones all the time. I mix on headphones all the time. Necessity. Absolutely, still, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's no... Yeah, I do like using those, some of those emulations to check what it like, sounds like in a real room. Uh, the Abbey Road one is the one I trust, and the reason why I trust it is because I was in Abbey Road, I put the headphones on, I listened to a mix, I took the headphones off, press play, listen for the speakers, and it sounded the same. So <laughs> so I do trust that one. I can't speak about Chris's one, the CLA one, because I have worked in his room, but the whole idea of memory is bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, I don't remember it sounding like that. Yeah. You know, somebody else is making that point, you know. As much as I, 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 I have a hard time hearing anything through those just because yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't, for my philosophy, it doesn't make sense to use a room and that you don't know that I don't know. Yeah. And on top of it, that I don't hear traditional music coming through speakers like that. It almost is like what we said about like a client coming and attending your session. You come into that room instantly. It's going to be weird to them. And if they're making decisions based off that, it's going to reflect that in your mixes. Low end, high end, transients. I mean, you can literally do this and your snare drum will go 2 dB different. Mm -hmm. So depending on who's checking it, that's why it's tricky because that could be the devil's triangle that I just ugh, get scared about. Um, Red Spot, why do some sound so songs sound good when you turn them down and others fall apart? Arrangement. I mean, it could be everything. I mean, I did notice sometimes when you mix really loud and then you listen to it quiet, it sounds worse. Or the opposite. I know Bruce Wadeen used to say, the quieter you mix, the better it sounds loud. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, there's that, if you're turning it up, turning up, turning up, there's one of two massive things that are probably happening is you want more low end so you turn it up because you want to feel the low end more number one and then secondly if you've been doing it for an hour it's because you're burning out your high mids on your ears and you're just trying to make it sound more exciting so all of those things are take a break take a break take a break you know get yourself out of the situation if it's early on in the mix and you're cranking it then you should turn it down and try and get your low end right but yeah i've done that so many times i i, I remember i did an album where andy Wallace mixed like eight of the songs, seven of the songs, and three were mixed by Randy Storb. And they both sounded great. But I was going through the tracks and I went, and he mixed that, didn't he? He said, yeah. because yeah, he, he mixes really yeah. quite, doesn't he? And then like track number three, I'm like, did Randy like Storb that. mix that? And they're like, how do you know? I was like, it's so much brighter. Because Andy, yeah. I, I love Andy Wallace. Yeah, he's he, definitely one of my favorite all time mixers. You do not want to be in a room when he's mixing because you're like, yeah, he can hear chair everything. And... What was that? What was that? My science teacher. I remember we 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 would always get Subway here. Remember we'd always back in the day get, and and always have like chips. And I remember we had when we had like three interns here. We used to have, we used to, we used to have a lot of interns at one stage, and they'd be sitting there and they'd be like, it's like yeah, it's like movie chips. theater. And I'd be like, <laughs> really? Well, I'm just eating. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like. You're trying to mix and you're like listening to this acoustic. And you're like, That's why you can't mix with people in the room. It's yeah. absolutely horrible. <laughs> um, Karen says, what are your favorite mixes by other engineers that you use for reference? I don't know if I use references, but I can tell you. Inspire? Inspiring mixes that anytime I hear something working out, because that's where I listen most to music is working out. I don't like to listen to music terribly a ton in the car anymore. It's usually Beatles radio or something that's just underneath or jazz. But if something comes on, I will hit repeat 
that's a good sign usually. And it's mm -hmm. usually the song and the mix, not just the mm -hmm. song. Andy Wallace, pretty much anything he did in the 90s would yep. always be king. I was listening to the, the Ghost record that Fish did, that Andy Wallace mixed. It's a phenomenal sounding record. Just magic. He's got the touch. And the fact that he only uses this and doesn't use a ton of other sounding upward gear and reverbs, it'll just be very simple. SPX 90, yeah. I think he uses an SPX 90 from what I remember. But anything that is that sounding, anything that has kind of, you know, I just was listening to Sade's Soldier of Love album. Right. That's a phenomenal sounding record. That's actually, some of it's, I think, Michael Brower and then the others, some other engineers in England, I didn't remember the names. Which album, sir? Soldier of Love. That was 2010 mm. Sade record. Very good record. I love Sade. Yeah. There's tons. I mean, jeez, I don't even know. I would have to write out all the records I love. Obviously, anything that sounds great in the 80s and 70s is great. Um, rock records are tricky. I was listening to Filter the other day um, and listening to that Take a Picture album, the Untitled record. And I think that was a Pro Tools mixed album, but it has such a great... It's Who mixed of, it? I don't know. And Jeff Moll was their assistant. I don't remember who mixed that album. But it has a very specific sound. And, you know, same as like, let's go back to Wilco. You listen to every Wilco album, it's very specific sounding to whoever engineered it. Being there was, you know, Chris Shepard, I believe. Then Summer Teeth was Michael Hagler. I'm just thinking of all the different engineers. Jim Arook was Yankee with Chris Brickley. These are all different engineers that have their own specific sound. Ghost was Jeff or Jim Arook. Oh, Ben Gross. Ben, ben, ben Gross uh, produced it and mixed it. I think he did everything. Awesome. Yeah, Ben Gross is amazing. He mixed it on SSL. Okay, so yeah. maybe that wasn't yeah, on SSL. Yeah. Yeah. I just I remember that era was. being 99 being a very specific kind of sound. I have an interview with him. It was quite a fascinating interview. He's very dry. He's very dry. He's probably like Andy in that respect. Very. Where is he at? He's in LA. He's in the valley somewhere. He's a rock guy, right? He's a rock guy. He has, yeah, he has an SSL room. There's a lot of outboard. He's very, um, not a lot of that, but not like Brower when it was just like racks or Chris CLA racks of stuff that was always He's, just. That cool. album is very kind of produced in the sense that it's very grid-like and right. a lot of parts are really, really grid-like in a really good, tasteful way. So that's a proof album that, yeah. Just because you're gritting and sound replacing and doing all these things, it's going to be motionless. Yeah. So you can know that, that you can still get all this vibe and stuff even when you're doing grids and sound replacing and auto-tuning and everything. You just right. got to do it tastefully. Yeah, and uh, Bob Ludwig mastered it. Outstanding. Yeah, I remember that was a huge, huge song, that Take a Picture. I love that song. I listened to that thing like three times in a row the other day. It's a great album. It's 99. Yeah. I thought it was actually older than that. Because it was, you know, so... Because you always think of, you know, Kurt Cobain and everything. And that was actually... A couple years after. Six, six years after he died. Yeah. So... That was right when I got in the industry. End of 99 was kind of the real era. And there's so many good records at that time period. A lot of Chicago records. Pumpkins... That era of kind of rock was huge then. SSL. Yeah, that was definitely Ben, yeah. He would have produced, engineered, and mixed it. Um, looks like the singer got credit as well, but yeah, Ben's ridiculously talented. Um, what's my favorite one? Karen, my favorite albums. I mean, most, you know, Bob Clear Mountain mixes. We all, every, everyone talks about Woman in Chains because it's one of the best. I'm a huge... It's it's a little weird because I feel like Women in Chains and um, um, uh, um, the Steve Lipson stuff from from kind of the early '80s when he was working with Trevor Horn, those records still are some of the best recorded records ever. They just tend to have a little bit of lack of low end because in yeah. the early '80s we giant speakers. Yeah, yeah, and just. We didn't, we didn't quite mix. So when I went to Focal and I used, I heard their Grand Utopias, these like half million dollar speakers, they're amazing. 
and certain things like modern classical recordings just brought you to tears because you heard yeah. this. But then I went back to Woman in Chains. It sounded amazing from like low mids up. It just needed a little extra oomph yeah. that you would get now, that Bob would put in now. That just you got to think about stereo systems at that time also had giant speakers. A lot giant of home speakers studios, and, and, not studios, but home speakers in general. I mean, my yeah. parents had an entertainment system. The speakers were like this big. They were big. So the drivers were big. So even if they were light on bass, they still had a lot of air pushing. Um, I was just thinking about the album. What was I thinking when you were saying that Bob Clear Mountain, all those great records. Oh, yes. Brothers in Arms is Mark, still... All digital. Yeah, one of the, my favorite sounding, mm -hmm. Dire Straits Brothers in Arms. Still one of the best sounding records yeah, ever. Jeff, Jeff Picaro on drums. Yeah. You can hear their sample drums just because the toms and stuff. It's just beautiful though. Same as like Huey Lewis 4. That's one of my oldest albums to memory growing up. Just beautiful sounding. And that's a, de a definitely a Mitsubishi digital album, I think. Otto's era of digital sounding albums are incredible sounding. Yeah, I mean, I still, I listen to the first commercially released digital album, which is Raikuda's Bop To You'll Drop. And does it sound a little thinner? Yeah. Does it sound really good? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's not always like, you know, it's like Oranges and Lemons. I'm a huge XTC fan. That album is like, really kind of EQ'd and thin sounding. It sounds like glass to me. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan. I know Paul Fox is a great guy, an amazing keyboard player. It just sounds a little thin to me. However, Mary Simpleton and there's some songs on it which are just so phenomenal. That's like so. Don't that forget. That was another Mitsubishi digital album, Peter Gabriel So. And yeah. I can't imagine, I mean, it's very, it's thin. It's very edgy, it's very sharp sounding, but I can't imagine it not sounding like that. I think it's just the yeah. atmosphere. Phenomenal sounding, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't, and this is what I'm starting to say is I don't think there's anything wrong with certain things having edge and harshness if it's applied correctly for vibe or if it just so happens accidentally work with whatever you're doing because yeah. I don't know, I get lost in this, like it's gotta be beautiful sounding, but I guess it doesn't. It just has to create some kind of emotion and honestly, if you think about like the differences between Cunning Crows, August and Everything After versus the Satellite mm -hmm. album, they're very different sounding records. They're also very different produced records. Two different producers. One's very organic and huge sounding. One is very rock and dirty sounding. Mm -hmm. One's thinner sounding than the other, but I couldn't imagine if you swapped them yeah. sonically with the songs, it probably wouldn't work. Long December mixed the way that and it begins, it's very, like, no, that wouldn't work. Yeah, Recovering Satellite, so what a freaking amazing album. You can go on and on about all these records. Yeah, I love that album. That's a great album, but that's that's an album that inspires me for guitar tones, for arrangements. You know, I'm not sleeping. It goes into that total Beatles section. Um, you know, they're rocking yeah. through all this shit. I mean, that, yeah. That's just a great record, Yeah. My friend Brad engineered that. and a lot just, of Mellotron in that record. Too. Yeah, such a great record. It was the right balance, like super American. That was very risky but, to come out with a sophomore record that was, it was very kind of Fleetwood Mac doing the thing after Rumors coming out with Tusk is super dangerous. But it really worked for, for Counting Crows. Yeah. I mean, the idea that their sophomore record was a million percent different. Wasn't the first album a T-Bone Burnett album? Yeah, I can't Very organic, very player -y very song oriented and the second record was just like we want to get back to rock and roll and playing hard yeah. and the songs are equally strong like long december it's crazy thinking back to like desert life which was their third album which i didn't really get into when i was in high school but now listening to it, it sounds incredible yeah same as hard candy which i think was a stevie they're a great band stevie i mean they're all right they're all like early mid thirties. They weren't kids. They've yeah. been made, they've been playing in bands. They've been really working hard. It's kind of like Train. They were older guys. Yeah. yeah. So when they finally do hit, they've already, they've already kind of recorded three or four albums before they record their first album. If you know what I mean, they've already got that. I was thinking about this last night with Matchbox Twenty, mm -hmm. and we were talking about uh, Matt Seralek. What's, what's his Matt name? Seletic. Seletic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you listen to Matchbox 20's first album versus, let's say, their third album. 
they were way stronger band by the third album, but the first one was very raw and sounding. The songs were just magic. And I do talk to people about this, like where we grew up with these albums. It could be any kind of album. It doesn't have to be a specific hi-fi record or anything. And you just, it, it gets ingrained into your memory system. And then 15 years later, you hear it again, and it doesn't sound very good. But you remember it being so magical. Mm -hmm. And you're going, wow, it just doesn't sound very good. But then you can't imagine it sounding good. It's the same thing as like Beatles records. They were special sounding. I don't know if they were gorgeous sounding, but Abbey Road was pretty remarkable how well it sounded. But I think perfect example going back to the Matchbox 20 record was the first one sonically didn't sound like what you think it would sound. The songs were super good. By the third album, in my honest opinion, the songs weren't as strong as the first album, but sonically sounded incredible. Now, there wasn't anything different other than the idea that the band's on tour a lot, and it's harder to write, obviously, when you're on tour all the time versus not, but it's just interesting to hear different albums change sonically. I feel like artists now, bands now, don't necessarily get that same kind of feeling where the first record, the freshman record, sounds remarkably different than the second record or the third record. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. Same as like Collective Soul. Same thing. Like, well, first I first record was rough sounding, but man, the songs were good. Oh, I love, I love Collective Soul. But then I, I will defend Dosage, Collective Soul to the Dosage is one of my favorite sounding rock albums. I think they they get they get a lot of flack just because you know that oh that voice at the time everybody it's Arr. not Creed. I mean. You know, baby, lay your love. I mean, it's just melodies. No, they all have that R factor. That, that, the songs are so good. Yeah, Dosage is one of my favorite albums. It's that, a great album. There was I. I was working I think with that's a, Chris Lord Algae mixed that. I was, I was working with an artist a few years ago, and their manager was also managing them. And I was like, I just said, oh, when you talk to the guys in the band, just tell them I love them. They're such a great band. And they got they re definitely got because they did that first album. On ADATs, I think? Yeah, it sounds like it. But the songs are amazing, and the yeah. guitar parts are fantastic. And for even though it was like, you know, modern rock of the time, you heard more Zeppelin in it than you did, you know, other modern rock. STP. Yeah, yeah. it was really good. It's well, the great... funniest thing is, you know, you, you think about Creed now. <laughs> At the time, I liked Creed when it came out, and then what they became over those years, the four mm -hmm. years, just became a little more, eh, I'm not really into that whole universe. And now listening back to that, they were a killer band. Yeah, I've, like I've Scott listened, yes. Stapp, ridiculous vocalist. And it's really interesting because when COVID was happening, I think he did a live, a lot of these guys were doing these live Zoom videos. Yeah. And he did one and he did a bunch of the old Creed songs and he sounded amazing. And he had that cliche thing, that R factor that everyone had. Hootie and the Blowfish had it. It's, uh, they all had it. It was that sound yeah. in the 90s, but he went and took it to the ninth degree. But now you step away from that and listen to him as a band and the songwriting. It's really good. It's really good. I can say I actually like it. Same as like Dave Matthews. Definitely you go back to that era and it's very tasteful for that era. And I was just listening to Before These Crowded Streets. It's an amazing album. There's a lot of Peter Gabriel influence in that album. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I gotta order some food. I am so hungry. We, we better do uh, Country Store, I think. Yeah, you want a sandwich from Country Store? Sure. We're gonna do a sandwich. Can you grab one of the uh, willing participants to go and get that? Thank you everyone for tuning in. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a good uh, couple of oohs of chatting. Um, so, any burning desires? Last question. Better Last get question, it in. burning desires. Mixing or mono, directly stereo. Oh, it was mixing stereo. Check in mono if you want. But I like stereo. stereo. Yep. Uh, give me regards to Max Martin. I haven't seen him in a while. Last time I saw him was in... Um, uh, what's it called? Um, down on Melrose, uh, really posh studio on Melrose. Entry level preamp. Yes. There's one preamp that I think is still killer. Personas ADL 600. 
phenomenal sounding because it, it's it's still pretty cheap. I think you can get them for twelve hundred dollars. Oh, and of course, Cappy. Cappy, yeah, but that's Cappy. not tube. Oh, say tube. It says entry level tube preamp. Oh, I didn't hear tube. Sorry. Audioscape has a new tube okay. preamp that's killer. Yeah. And BAE do, uh, they don't do tube, but they do then Neva, cl Neva clone stuff. They do the cheaper version of it called. Solid state, you could go pretty much across the board. They're all pretty good. Yeah, UK sound. Yeah. Um, there was one uh, best SSL style plugin. Is it the SSL's version? Of the, the channel U strip? Just compressor, channel strip, you name it. It's pretty solid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. UADs is really good. The Waves is good. The new one? New Waves is great, yeah. Frick. I even like the old one. Yeah, the old one There's something about it. Doesn't sound like this, but. Channel strip that has this kind of thing. Yeah. That the low end does something similar. Not necessarily the same. Um, Plug Alliance is okay. I just like the new one because of the controller. Right. The UC1 controller. You can literally. We have a video coming out it. with Mark next week. Then you'll see him talk about the controller. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mary and Sam. Appreciate it. Um, ADL 600. I don't... Are you using ADL 600? Is that the answer to that's the the Mario Yeah, that's the Personas thing I just pitched. Oh, okay. I think it's amazing. Oh, okay, there you I go. I love it. No one liked it because it said Personas. I loved it. I'd still use it. I'm actually thinking about buying them all up. Ah. <laughs> it's got so much high voltage on it. I think that's why it's so special. Uh, uh, JKL just got in here. JKL, go back to the beginning because he's asking us, or they are asking us about Sooth 2. About half the first half of this video was talking about Sooth 2 and how much we love it. So go back and watch that. Um, thanks, John. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Peter. Um, and uh, everybody. Lights and motion. Best console for home studio on a budget. I don't know. I'd have to try them all, to be honest. Anything. So, and yeah, that's a tough one. Mackie DAB. Yeah, it's that's <laughs> that's, that's a digital so, console. Oh yeah. Um Joey says it wasn't designed by Presona, so it doesn't matter. I mean they're marketing it. Um thank you in Finland. Mark questions, why are you so good at what you do, says Andrea. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Andrea. All right. You rock. Thanks, so guys. But well. Happy design, au revoir, adios, dos vidania, tschüss, uh, ciao, adio, adios, um, tutsins, goodbye.